Well, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, the title of the talk is Graduate Education Where Teaching Meets Research. Um, and I'll do what I can. I, uh, I'm really quite overwhelmed by the size of the crowd. And uh, I would be, in general, open to corrections or suggestions, but we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll try to get up enough speed that we can finish before supper. So um, there are many ideas of universities. Uh, some of them are very old ideas. They go back to the medieval world. Some of them even derive from Roman or Greek ideas. Some are from other cultures. Higher education is not a, a, a prerogative of only the West. Uh, and some are current and are floating around in public debate today. And uh, so much of what is in the current today seems to be not much about students and their education. Uh, so a lot of it is about things like research and skills and finance and a whole range of important issues that I'm not going to speak about. And when the students do become the topic, what we often hear is uh, precisely a battle between something called liberal education, which I will not define tonight, and that skills and job stuff, which most people seem to think is what the university should be doing, or at least a lot of people do. And then even when somebody like Helen Small writes about research, which is not always the topic, not often, there is a quite meager diet, even in her work, on graduate education. And what there is about graduate education is about stuff that we've heard about for over 30 years, a long-standing and well-recognized crisis PhD students do not regularly go on to university jobs. I mean, some do, but a lot of them don't. This is so far from being news that when I presented a discussion that's going on, there's a national conversation going on, started from people at McGill. Uh, just this year, uh, the vice provost academic said, oh, come on, it's been 30 years. Um, but universities are slow to change, and this particular problem about the crisis um, is still with us, and it is not my topic tonight either, particularly, though there's some passing by it. Um, so my project is not all of these policy issues, as those of you who heard me last night, though there are probably very interesting policy implications. My project, indeed, is about ideas of the university, and my interest in ideas is with ideas historical, most of all, I um, hold that in order to think about the future, we actually have to have a quarrel with the past. It's also philosophical, because that's what I do. I'm not actually uh, a, uh, I'm an educator, I suppose, but I'm not trained in the academic field of higher education. And um, at the risk of really scaring you, I would say that my project is, in fact, transcendental. So tonight, I want to talk with you about the universities that you and I live in, the universities which are called the research university. And it is a latecomer to the ideas of universities. Um, many universities were chartered, founded, ran for centuries without ever thinking they were research universities. It's usually dated back to some debates that happened in Berlin in the early part of the 19th century when the University of Berlin was founded. And in our world, it's clearly uh, a result of the, second, of the building up of the university after the Second War. So what we're going to be looking at tonight is some idea of what it could be to be a research university and what the idea of a research university is. And to point, make the point a bit sharper, Research could happen outside the university. It could happen as it does in industry, in publicly supported labs, in royal societies and academies, in places like the CNRS or Princeton Institute for Advanced Studies, the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, which is part of the university, but the Princeton one isn't part of the university, in case you didn't know, or the Wissenschaftskolleg or the Max Planck Institutes, there are lots of places where research could happen where it wouldn't be in the university. So the key question is, what happens when we bring research into the university? Now, you would say, bring it in. It's the center of this, but it doesn't have to be. And that gives you an idea of the sort of strangeness of the questions I'm going to be asking. Um, 
They're a little wacky. They take what is very obvious to all of us, that research belongs in the university, and tries to interrogate why. And what's the, as it were, reasoning, what's the best reason to have research in the university? So the normal answer, of course, is that it has something to do with teaching. And that somehow teaching and research should happen together. That if we have research going on, the teaching will be better. Or maybe if we have the teaching going on, the research will be better. Or maybe both, if we're really lucky. Um, and once you've said that, of course it's true, because that's how our universities are. Uh, and if you're a graduate student, we have a lot to talk about tonight. So a word about myself. The Jacqueline Humanities Institute is one of those great creatures of the university, funded by a great donation and a lot of money from the university as well. It is a research-only institute. We have no classes. We have no regular faculty. We have research fellows. We have programs that we fund. It's a research facility. And it is intrinsically interdisciplinary. We only fund stuff that wouldn't be funded by normal departments, by normal units in the university. We never do any normal business. Perhaps more interesting, it is intergenerational. And so that's part of why I stuck with these questions about the graduate students. That is, we, we actually took it a bit further than most of the humanities centers and institutes that preceded us. And we brought in undergraduates. So our fellows, our faculty, postdocs, graduate students, and undergraduates. And part of what we're trying to do is find out what happens when you actually create a community that is genuinely intergenerational. It's a kind of laboratory question. And so, because I am the one who is supposed to wander around and talk about how wonderful and important humanities research is, I began to wonder what the heck it was and whether other research was different from humanities research and also why it was being done in the university. And that's where I began. So if you had been here, uh, here being there uh, last night, you'd have heard me speak about um, Friedrich Schleiermacher's distinctions, which I find to be extremely helpful for sorting out some things, even though it, the university he proposed didn't ever get built in, in just that sense. Um, and the distinction that I pushed very hard last night, um, Mark summarized beautifully in his email that some of you got today, that there is a difference between schooling, education, and research. And the distinction would be something like this. Schooling is learning the settled matters, or if you like, getting a lot of information, being taught information. Research is discovering new stuff, knowledge that nobody knew before. It's the space of invention and discovery, and also the space of exploring old things again and finding new things in them. And education comes between schooling and research as a kind of radical moment of disruption, of doubt, of exploration, a kind of critique of knowledge and its limits, in which the knowledge that has been handed in and indoctrinated into people in schooling is subject to a moment of real reflection and a discovery of what makes it knowledge and also what doesn't. So the question in this scenario of schooling, education, and research is what can research do to help us in education? That is, if research is about discovering new knowledge and thinking about things from the fresh, things we didn't know before, then what does that do in that activity of disturbing everything we already knew, of teaching us something about what it means to learn, of teaching us about the limits of knowledge? That is, in Schleiermacher, and I think he was insightful but wrong, in Schleiermacher's view, you would just work on the old stuff at that moment. But my question is, how does, as it were, an inflow of new insight, new knowledge, actually contribute to the task of education? Not what does it contribute in terms of discovery or commercialization or translation. What does it do for education? 
to be doing research. Can we figure out how these things go together? So I'd like to ask a very simple, irritating question at this point, which is, what is a PhD? So um, uh, you all, or almost all, are either doctors of philosophy or destined to be doctors of philosophy. Um, an MD is not the same thing. A JD is not the same thing. Somehow, our graduate schools are deeply committed to the notion that we should give people, as their final degree, a PhD, a doctor of philosophy. So normally when people say, oh, well, that's different than just being really good, maybe even a master of something, that's different because, because to do the PhD, you have to do some methodological reflection. You, you achieve a certain level of self-consciousness about the work in your field, and you have this higher order reflection. Um, and that this would be a distinctive characteristic of the PhD, that you really knew something about how your field knows what it knows, and that's what you do. You write a degree, you write that dissertation, you defend it, and you have a PhD. So you all become philosophers. You all are engaged in, as it were, meta whatever, meta biology, meta chemistry, meta philosophy, meta English. But here's the interesting question. What if we turn it just sideways? I agree with all that. That's good. And you all should be philosophers. I'm very happy to welcome you all into the, the whole university is populated by philosophers. I mean, you, you realize that. Most of you are unknowing, and I think that's actually probably the best kind of philosopher, is a philosopher who doesn't know he's a philosopher. But let's go back to that idea about education. So if education is this unsettling moment, this critical, disturbing turn, that moment, then to be a doctor of philosophy would be to be the person who teaches that unsettling, to be the instigator of that for others. To be a PhD is to be qualified to be a doctor, to be a teacher of that moment of education. So that turns out to be the essence in this kind of account of the PhD. It's not that you merely have experienced your thinking getting stirred up, your discovery of the limits of knowledge. It's not merely that you're now qualified to go out and do all kinds of great research. You're actually qualified to teach others to recognize the limits of knowing in your field. You are so good at it that you can not merely give them information, but you can, as it were, take it away again. You can undermine the assumptions in the field, in your discipline, for the undergraduate students. Now that would be a very good thing to be able to have that quality. Because that would mean you were qualified to be an educator in this sort of model, where education is this moment of doubt and disturbance. And then comes the question again, so then what does it mean to be capable of the discoveries, of the research? Because usually we think that these PhDs are sort of the ticket to do more research, right? not necessarily the ticket to be a teacher. Um, and in fact, many people who get PhDs do not become teachers, which is OK. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But somehow the question is, again, what is that capacity to do research and to discover new things? How does that figure in the more fundamental question of being able to be the teacher who unsettles the knowledge that people already have, the information which is stable, recognizable, known? How does the discovery of new things have that capacity? So if I now have confused you about what your PhD is going to be or is, then I'd like to ask just one more of these sorts of questions, which is, what is a professional degree then? What is a JD or an MD or so on and so forth? Right? So if the doctors of philosophy are meant to be capable of doing this disturbing teaching, right? This undermining and regrounding, this limiting and 
uh, exploration of the, of the challenges of knowing, you might have thought that a professional degree was something like going to school. Sometimes we call it law school or medical school, in which case you'd learn a lot of information. But that's not what they are in the university. Not that people who are in these professional schools aren't learning a lot of information. They are. Everybody's learning a lot of information. But they're doing something else altogether. The classic description, and I have a colleague, a student who's now a colleague at the Faculty of Law at Toronto, is that they're wanting to think like a lawyer. It's very interesting. Think like a lawyer. Think like a doctor. Think like an engineer. So they're actually being taught a way of thinking. They're not being taught the stuff that they need to know. It's not information. It's not content. It's a way of thinking. And in fact, my friend um, is running a course on this at the Faculty of Law, just trying to see if even the first year students could figure out what this might mean to think like a lawyer. So what happens in these professional degrees is there's a fundamental gap between the education that people receive and the skills, the job-ready skills, of practicing. Somebody who graduates with a JD is not ready to practice law. They will article. They will have to pass exams. Similarly, the medical doctor, my heavens, you have the internships, you have the residences, you have maybe a postdoc or two. It turns out that most of these professional degrees in our university are actually pointedly short of exactly what it would mean to be able to become that professional. Um, now, it's not their fault. In fact, in some ways, it's their glory. Though, of course, there's pressure now, and people teach practical courses in the law schools and the medical schools. They teach clinic. But still, the practice of those professions is not what the university prepares people for. It's not the same as being a doctor, that is a doctor of philosophy. Their job when they get out is not to disturb what everybody thinks medicine is, or what everybody thinks the law is. If they did that, they'd do a PhD in law or a PhD in medicine, and they would be engaged in the same radical, disruptive, questioning, limiting, analysis of the shape of knowledge. But it's still interesting to compare how even the professional degree is not a job-ready skills kind of qualification, um, which many of our, uh, much of the debate in the popular press hasn't quite got its head around. OK. I'm now going to talk about, I'm now going to switch slightly to the second part of my talk. It has sort of four. It's hard to say exactly what happens between three and four. But the second part is a part that is a, um, it's an attempt to grab a series of problems which everybody does talk about now for 30 years and see if we could come up with a slightly different perspective of it just to give us a context for some of the questions we're thinking about. So, for want of a better term, I will say that we have a problem with the overpopulation of PhDs. We have more than we have jobs in the university. Now, it turns out that in many societies, this would be a boon. Um, and in fact, it is actually a boon in Canada. And many of the governments, many of the provincial governments, want to have even more. But in our PhD programs, we dramatically overemphasize the fate of our students as a reproduction exercise. That is, we regard somebody who does a PhD degree as a success only if they end up in a tenure track position, if they, as it were, look like us when they're done. So this is a very deeply embedded commitment and value. And it does produce a lot of grief, and it is also false. Um, most of our students, most of the students who enter our PhD programs do not end up in tenure track jobs. It's even worse in biomedical stuff, 15%. Now, of course, in the very elite universities, they do land a lot of their people who finish, but not who start. 
Attrition is almost half in the PhD program. I'm sorry, this is beginning to sound like one of those awful lectures that they give you in the bio, in the you know, in the uh, in the biology course, the first year course. Look around, you know, one of you won't be here, sort of thing. Um, is, is that a generic comment, like for the country as a whole? It's a generic comment for uh, higher education as a whole. It's just not the case that um, people who enter finish, and it's not the case that people who finish go on in large numbers to tenure track jobs. There are exceptional departments and programs, but that's not what happens. On the other hand, they do go on to other kinds of jobs and not at Starbucks. Um, well, I mean, maybe at Starbucks. Maybe they run the Starbucks. I don't know, own the Starbucks. But what happens is that the skills that people acquire in graduate school are actually extremely valuable for doing all kinds of things in society. And it is the professors who are most embarrassed that they are somehow failing there by having students who do not reproduce and become the same as themselves. So there is a discussion, yet another discussion on this. And particularly of interest is the question of whether the skills involved in graduate school might, in fact, the kind of thinking that goes on in graduate school, perhaps the ability to cope with the unsettling of knowledge, whether that could be a very positive thing elsewhere in our society. So that would be sort of my general offer to you, is that the thing that makes a PhD worth it would be worth it in lots of places. But I su suggest, and this is with a nod to um, my local context and also to an interesting series of problems which you'll see emerge as I keep going, that we might switch from this problem of reproduction and overpopulation to something that one might call a sustainable model. That is, the question is, what would graduate schools look like? What would graduate education be about if its goal was sustainability? Now, I am, as some of you know very well, and others will find out within about 35 seconds, I am an utter uh, amateur, perhaps one would even say a uh, a, a, an ignorant person in the matters of sustainability. There are, yeah, are lots of studies about this population reproduction sustainability stuff. It's a very hot topic. It's a very important political topic. Uh, it's not something I know very much about, but if, um, if I get it wrong, somebody else can correct me, but it's, I don't think it's been applied successfully to graduate education yet. And uh, so I throw down the gauntlet on that one. But part of the challenge would be to understand that graduate education was based more on flow through, on people coming through their graduate degrees, than on getting stuck. And it would be very valuable to recognize the limits of reproduction as such. So what we're looking then at is what would make graduate education intrinsically valuable. It would be a good thing to have it to be in the university, but it would be a good thing to have transferred into other contexts. So that's one sort of opposition, reproduction sustainability, for thinking about graduate school. And now I'm going to give you another one, which is based on um, the work of one of the philosophers I work on, so that you have two models to sort of play with in your mind. So um, this one, so this was um, reproduction, which we all mean by which I assume we all understand that the goal of a, doing a PhD is to get an academic tenure track job. Right? That would be the reproduction model. And sustainability is in tension with that in a positive way. Not that we don't want you to get tenure track jobs, but there are other ways of having a sustainable system. Now the other model I'm going to give you is um, based on the work of Le Emmanuel Levinas, and it, re it revolves around fecundity. If you can read my writing, you can probably go on to graduate school. <laughs> so Levinas um, begins with something very simple. Uh, and it's, it, his ethics is, is uh, those of you who don't know anything about it, it's OK. Um, by the time we finish, you won't know much, but you'll maybe know a little bit. So um, if we have a self here, if we have me, and we say ethics is about, it's about being responsible for myself, OK? so. This is a very, I would call it a very adolescent image. Um, 
Now you have to take responsibility for yourself. A lot of ethics, a lot of philosophy has focused on this. And um, I think it's a good idea. People should be responsible for themselves, definitely. It's called integrity and so on and so forth. When politicians say this, you have to look out. <laughs> um, but they do say it. However, for Levinas, that's really not the interesting kind of responsibility at all. Instead, I am going to be responsible for another person. So actually, I'm going to put the arrow that way for now. So that if somebody's hungry, I'm responsible for seeing that they get fed. If there are dirty dishes in the sink, I'm responsible for doing them. Sometimes I have to clean up the messes that other people make. This is part of being human. This is part of being mature. This is part of being an ethical agent, is to be able to be responsible for what happens to other people, not just for me, but for other people. This is a very radical thought. In Levinas's work, it's asymmetrical. I'm responsible for what happens to the other person. The other person is not similarly responsible for what happens to me. So it's not a freeloading. It's a heavy burden. It's a notion of being obliged. However, just when you thought it was safe and you might have thought that was a good idea, imagine if this other person also has responsibilities for other others. And now, I am also responsible for his responsibility. So he's responsible for this person. I'm responsible for him. And being responsible for him is being responsible for his responsibility. Well, I can't control what he does. That's right. You can't control what he does. But you still could have to bail him out if he ends up in jail. You still could have to make good on the mortgage. You might still have to help. You might still, in some deeper sense, be obliged for others beyond your control. For Levinas, ethics is not about what I can control. It's about actually being, as it were, on the hook for what happens to others. Now, this structure, this fecund structure, those of you who know something about the word fecundity, fits with children extremely well. The thing your child does, maybe against your will, is something that you are on the hook for. You are obliged not just to make sure that your child has enough to eat, but that if your child picked on somebody else, you're the one who's going to have to clean it up. It's going to have to make good their fault. And there's nothing greater in satisfaction than having a child who actually shoulders those responsibilities for others. This is also a structure that governs our relationship with our students. Teaching is this kind of fecundity. Now, we all know that Socrates said that my students, are, they're, when they're with me, they're perfectly reasonable. I can't help it if when they leave me, they become tyrants and revolutionaries and all kinds of horrible people. But in fact, that's because in general, we do hold the teacher responsible for what the students do. We have a default assumption that somehow, as a teacher, you have a responsibility for your students. And if we take that responsibility one step further, we can imagine that the most pointed kind of responsibility or fecundity in teaching would be to teach somebody who then went on to teach. So we have a kind of multiplication across generations. Now, they might not be that much younger. You might not need to wait 30 years to see how it comes out. But there's an ideal that when one is teaching, one is hopefully teaching somebody who could, in fact, teach another. And if the teaching that you offer is not just some information, but is a way of thinking or living, if it's a way of confronting the limitations of our knowledge or the challenges of, new of a new environment, then there would be a, an idea that what one wanted to do was create in the student the capacity 
to create that capacity in another student. And now you can begin to see where I'm going to be going shortly with the graduate students. There is a kind of ethical interpretation of the work of handing down in a tradition that focuses on the teacher capacitating the student to become a teacher that can capacitate another student. It's not just one step, but a second iteration, and probably forever, but at least for now, we'll just go two steps, and that probably is enough. Now, according to Levinas, this is not limited to those who are our children and those who are our students. This is a structure of our social network. This is what it means to live in society, is that we are actually, as it were, on the hook for what other people do to other people. So it's almost the complete opposite of our normal liberal political theoretic model where basically I'm only responsible for what I do or what I agree to do. What we find instead is a notion that the, we are awash in many complicated webs of responsibility for each other. And they go very far. And it's not merely a question of making sure that I take care of myself or that I take care of the person near me, but I'm actually morally connected to how they treat other people. This is a kind of solidarity that is much more profound than just sharing bread. This is a solidarity at an ethical level. I would like to think, in a special crazy moment, that universities are one of those institutions where you could actually model that, where people could be so in tune to this kind of responsibility for other people and where the stakes could be adjusted in such a way that it wasn't a life and death struggle, that it could be the sort of place where that kind of expanding and deepening responsibility reached out throughout the education. So that's the stakes. Not much, you know, just a very, um, very different ethical vision of what teaching and learning might be. So I'm almost ready to start um, the game, and um, I'm not running too bad on time. The third part. So I'd like to um, think about what happens with graduate students in two different sites, two different contexts. If I were better at it, I would throw some graduate students into a clinical environment and a professional training environment, but I, I don't know enough about it to say, I, I don't even know enough to talk about what I don't know, whereas I can pretend in these other areas. I can't even pretend there. So I'm just going to focus on two environments in which graduate students operate in our context. One is the lab, the, what, what shall we say, the laboratory or the laboratory? Um, uh, the lab, there we go, thank you. In the lab and in the classroom, or if you like, class. But we'll say classroom, okay. So what I'm interested in thinking about with you is the kind of, I'm going to go through a series of models to think about the way that education, this questioning and discovery of the limitations of knowledge, flows between faculty and graduate students and in some cases undergraduates. And um, I did cheat a little bit, um, uh, enough to make um, probably some people squirm when I get it wrong. I, I, I thought, well, I'm coming to UBC. I'll talk to some people. And so I've been talking to some people. Um, the irresistible field was sustainability. So poor John is sitting here in the front row almost. Um, and it's not all his fault. Um, uh, I didn't start with John, but I got there. Um, and I'd like to give some examples from graduate education in sustainability at the at UBC, but those are examples in the strict philosophical sense, which means you could probably sw swap in other things without too much trouble. So I'm now going to go through five different figures. Is that right? Yes, five different figures, trying to think through the kind of flow and the kind of work that graduate students do in relationship not to only to research, but in the placement of research in this educational task. And if these work at all, we'll have a good time. So, magic. So the first one will be a classroom environment. 
And this will be something which is actually extremely familiar. Um, this is an argument about research. And the argument goes something like this in the first case, that if we have a faculty member doing cutting edge research, they can bring that research and they can bring it into the classroom, into the teaching environment, particularly for the undergraduate student. Right? So what we say is it's a great thing for our students to hear about the most exciting new things that are going on in research. And the research happens outside of the classroom, outside of this context, but then it's like a report from the front. We are doing amazing things in stem cell research, says the biochemistry professor, as they start to discuss the very simple, straightforward, and basic things that they're doing. But they, you know, they bring a bit of this report. Um, and in this case, um, I don't know if Vin is here, because I don't know Vin to see him. Yes. Um, I would say that um, it's quite possible to say that you, know, you might be bringing in um, new, step, new things in eco-theory into a literature class, talking about what other people are talking about elsewhere. The newest theories are then moved from the space of research. Don't worry, you get a second swing. <laughs> from the space of research into teaching. This, I would say, is a very limited kind of relationship. And often, it's the only justification we get for why we should have research in the university so that the students can hear about the brave new thoughts that the great scientists are engaged in. Von Humboldt said, actually, there's a flow in the opposite direction. And in that moment, what you get is that the student in the classroom is asking questions about the old stuff, the old books which we still love to teach, or the old theory which everybody knows, and that when the teacher, the faculty member presents it, as they hear the questions and as they imagine the other questions, they get a deeper understanding of the knowledge which they had. It actually changes the shape of their knowledge. Now this is an experience that almost all of us who have ever taught know very well. What we thought we were teaching is not what we end up teaching because somebody asks a question. Or even if they don't ask a question, we have this implicit questioning going on that disrupts our assumptions about what's going on. And therefore, teaching feeds the research. Not that research feeds the teaching, but the teaching feeds the research. And that's why those of us who get in administrative positions and don't teach very much, don't produce as much research. I really think that's that simple. In the humanities, the only way you can really learn something new is by teaching it. I hope that doesn't bother too many people, but if it bothers you, that's okay. <laughs> so the teaching actually feeds the research. So we have this nice little circle, and that's the first figure. So far, no graduate students, right? I'm going too long. Life is short. You're all, you're all, you're all prisoners. I can't skip any of these now. Now the second figure, <laughs> the second figure is from the faculty member to the graduate student to the undergraduate. And this, of course, is what we think. This is our normal sense. There's a nice linear progression. And what people are doing is the faculty member in an ideal world or a better world is teaching the graduate student how to teach the undergraduate. Okay. So this is something kind of interesting. If it was merely content, so I'll put a box for content, then you could pass the box to the graduate student, tell them, pass it on, and the undergraduate could have it. Or in a better world, you could just skip the graduate student, just give them the box. Here's the stuff. OK, now you know it. Some good information. You're set. But in fact, in fact, what we have here is the graduate student 
is being taught how to teach. He's not being taught the content. He's being taught how to teach, and then he is teaching. So he's getting a different experience, or she is getting a different experience than the undergraduate. The undergraduate's being taught something, perhaps how to find the limits of knowledge, etc. We will have it be a good educational environment, not too much information. But the graduate student is learning how to teach, which is not the same as learning that disruptive thing. It's learning how to create the disruptive thing. They're on the way to becoming doctors of philosophy. Okay. This is, I would say, not a bad model. There's only one thing missing here. Research. If we were merely training teachers in graduate school, this model would be okay. But we aren't. What happens when we bring research in? The diagram gets weirder. Well, forget that. I'll just go through paper faster. This is figure three. Let's take laboratories, or labs for short, and put some graduate students in them. OK. Let's not have any undergraduates. That's too confusing. So we have a faculty member, and we have a graduate student. Now. Labs come in different flavors, as you might know. So the easiest and most reasonable way is to have the graduate student merely supporting the faculty member as a research assistant. They're the ones who wash up, run the data, you know, all that good stuff. The high power intellectual work that's needed to run the, okay, so the, basically all the gopher work. Now, if that's your lab, I'm not sure whether you're learning a whole lot about how to do anything except how to do the gopher work, but unfortunately there are labs of that sort. It's possible. Second choice. Let's do it together. Let's collaborate. This, I think, is probably more common, or even if it isn't more common, it's certainly more laudable. So here we have the possibility that a faculty member and a graduate student are working on a project together. It's one project, they're both working on it. Third model. The faculty member is working on his project, the graduate student is working on her project, and the faculty member is supporting the graduate student. Now we're getting somewhere. Now what we're beginning to see is the possibility that a faculty member could help a graduate student discover new information, could learn new things, could in fact learn how to find out stuff that nobody knows. The faculty member doesn't know. Nobody knows. That's why it's research. We have to run at the lab. We have to run the test. We have to try the experiment. Until we do that, we don't know, but if you're new at doing research, you may need some support. So in this case, you're getting very little. You're um, doing the important work that somebody had to do. In this case, we're working on it together. So you actually get to see me, the faculty member, work on how do I find out stuff that nobody knows? And you're trying to learn how to do that. But you do it you know, right next to me. In this case, I'm supporting you, the graduate student, to find out for yourself. So John, um, John is actually very good at this. Um, and uh, the examples that keep coming from the rest of this are amazing. So John told me about David Maggs, who is a PhD student, who managed to do an amazing project on sustainability, where he was actually showing how the artistic practices and the way that we see in art had so much to offer in actually transforming how we think about sustainability and persuading people to, to do sustainability. And the thing that's so interesting is nobody had ever thought that, really, that way before. David's research is genuinely groundbreaking. 
It's not merely that he found out something that nobody knew before. He found out like a space. He's opening a space that people hadn't even been in. Now, John hadn't been there either. And even now, John might not know as much as David about this stuff, aside from the fact that he had to read it all. So this is a, a model of supporting a graduate student and trying to teach them how to do research. OK. Now comes the hard part. We're going to take the second one and mix it with the fourth one, third one, and third one, and we're going to do the fourth one. So we're going to have a faculty member, graduate student, and an undergraduate. So now we have a lab, and this is kind of like Alan Kingston's lab. Alan could be here tonight. We have a lab where you have undergraduates and graduate students, and it's kind of a mess um, to get the diagram quite right. So I'll do what I can. So there are some cases where the undergraduate is, um, fortunately, has replaced the graduate student as the research assistant. And what they do is they wash up and crunch the data and do all that stuff. So their role is to support a project that is either the graduate students or more likely um, one that the two, the graduate student and the faculty member are doing. So what they're learning is how to be a gopher, uh, somebody who doesn't actually discover new knowledge but gets to watch other people discover new things. This is not a great model, but it's not uncommon. Now, <coughs> I can barely figure out my own scribbles because it gets so complicated. Imagine if the faculty member is teaching the graduate student how to do research, right? How to learn new things, how to learn unknowns, how to discover, I'll just put in for now. And the graduate student is trying what? To teach the undergraduate how to discover. Imagine a lab in which the graduate student is not merely learning how to discover, but is also teaching how to discover. But learning how to discover and teaching how to discover are not the same thing. Somehow, this graduate student actually has to learn not how to discover, but how to teach how to discover, how to do research. So the graduate student now, in this model, is actually mediating in a specific way between the faculty member and the undergraduate, because the undergraduate's also a discoverer, is actually doing research. Now we see research and teaching piled on top of each other in a much more complicated way, and I've barely gotten to the end of it. I hate to tell you this. Because each of them is going to be engaging. And if it, in some model, each of them has their own project. So in this case, this is the most complicated drawing here. We'll get simpler after this. And, and I'll even be able to end within 45 minutes or two hours or something like that. <laughs> Don't worry, there'll be time for lunch. Uh, supper, maybe. <laughs> so in Alan's lab, for instance, um, uh, Alex de Giacomo, is Alex here? Oh, she didn't make it. So she was a graduate student who was working on one of these really great projects in his lab that was her project that she did with an undergraduate, David Wu. There's even a publication that came out of it, so it must be real. They did this great project on discovering the kind of behavior that happens when people recycle in a sustainable building, which is they recycle a lot more. And they did a careful psychological lab exam on the uh, exploration on that. But what you had then was a, a faculty member, a graduate student, and an undergraduate. And they were learning. The graduate student, Alex, was she, 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 I spoke with her, it was wonderful. She said, well, it was just the environment. It was like, you didn't want the undergraduate just to be your research assistant. So they did a project together. So that's not this model, that's this model, right? They're doing a project together. And somehow the faculty member 
was able to create the environment which created the capacity in the graduate student and in the undergraduate, but in the graduate student to not merely be a researcher, but to also work with and help teach the undergraduate how to do this thing called research. Now, um, uh, Jiaying Zhao is maybe here? Yeah, hi. So in her lab, the graduate students are doing their thing, at least I may get it wrong, we'll pretend I'm right in any case. But the undergraduates are doing their own projects. And her student, Sumaya, Sumaya Kakal, um, did the best psychology research project in Canada last year <laughs> in that lab. And again, what you see is that this capacity to teach how to do research is not the same as the capacity to do research, or is it? Right? That's the question. That is, if a research intensive university is going to work, if that's what we are, then somehow what's going on in some of these labs is the capacity for the research and the teaching to become so tightly wound, bound together that in order to be a successful doctor of philosophy, you also have to not merely do research, but allow or encourage other people to do research. So this is the engine of research in the university. One more figure, those of you who don't like labs, that's like those of us in the humanities. You could have a classroom or a lecture hall, and you could have a faculty member, and you could have a bunch of undergraduate students in rows listening to you talk. And that would be a good thing to do. You could give them all sorts of information. You could teach them the new stuff. And maybe there'd be the flow back from their questions. But then let's say we put a graduate student in the middle of this. What's the graduate student doing in that class? Grading papers. It's like being a research assistant in the laboratory. All the hard and not very satisfying intellectual labor that has to go into it. But maybe not. Maybe it's possible that the graduate student gets to give some lectures or run some seminars or research or whatever you call them here, tutorials, whatever they are, sections. And in those sections, the faculty member gets to give content and the graduate student gets to give content too. They become a teacher in that environment. But maybe it's more complicated. Maybe, and here Vin gets a second kick at the can, Maybe it's like what happened in his course on Imagining Nature, where his MA students were not merely teaching, but were actually using the teaching to develop their own research. So we have a loop there, where their teaching is developing their research in the sense of our first diagram with that flow back from the students to the research. Now the graduate student is in the middle of that, activating that loop Okay. So these are images or models where the graduate students' teaching and research actually are complicated and involved together. I only have uh, two, really, it's one more part, but the code is a little bit longer than it maybe should be. So now a word from our sponsor, economics. So who pays for the graduate students? In the sciences, the research funding pays for the graduate students for the most part. So in the sciences, the faculty member gets a very nice big grant and it covers most of the cost, if not all the cost, of feeding and clothing the graduate student. And that's a very good idea. In the social science and the humanities, oh, especially in the humanities and the arts, we don't get those funds for our graduate students. So um, they're teaching is actually what pays for the graduate students. So basically, there's an economic question about graduate students. And I can ask it in the most blunt way, but it, there are like five of those, they just keep going. Could we run our undergraduate programs without the graduate students? No, we could not. We have thousands and thousands of undergraduates, and the graduate students have to do the grading 
I'm going to speak again to sound like a union stump speech. They have to do the grading, and they lead the tutorials, so they are involved in the labs. They do all this stuff, because we have like so many undergraduates. Though, of course, we do get some money from the undergraduates that helps pay for the graduate students in the humanities, and the money that we get in the provincial funding for the humanities students, who are so many, helps pay for the indirect costs for the sciences. It's messy economics. But the university is in an economic model where it needs those graduate students. Could we run the undergraduate programs without research? Of course we could. Research doesn't pay for the undergraduates for the most part. We could be uh, like a small college of some sort or Quest or something or I don't know. Well, maybe not Quest. But there are models for undergraduate programs that don't have a lot of research. Another question. Could we run the graduate programs without the undergraduates? Like, do we need all those undergraduates? And part of the answer is, well, certainly in the humanities, probably we do. And the sciences, to some extent, the sciences are riding on the units that the undergraduates bring in. It's a very bad bunch of equations. But there is a real need for our research programs to have undergraduates. In fact, that would be the next question. Could we run our research programs without graduate students? Could we just have graduate students and undergraduates? I'm sorry, could we just have faculty and undergraduates? Why do we want graduate students? Could we run our research program without undergraduates? See, these are the kinds of questions I like to ask, just because we all assume that everything has to be in the picture at the same time. And part of the reason, this is a, um, you know, Nancy, I hope you were appreciating this. Part of the reasoning here is straightforward economics, budgeting problems. To run the university, we need all this stuff, at least so we think. So that's, that's sort of one set of questions. So can we run the undergraduate programs without the graduates? Can we run the undergraduate programs without the research? Can we run the graduate programs without the undergraduates? Can we run the research without graduates or without undergraduates? But let me ask it another way. And this is the final part. We could ask the question academically, like, what do we really want? Not like, what do we have to do to make the money flow and cover the bases, but what do we really want? And so the first and the fundamental question I have for you is where I started a long time ago. Is what is the goal of graduate education? It isn't probably just to balance the books or allow us to run our undergraduate program, and it probably isn't just to run our research labs. There has to be, I would say, as a philosopher, there has to be a goal for graduate education. And we need to think about that in relationship to some of these charts where research and teaching do something together that's quite different than the goal of undergraduate education. So this comes in three flavors. The first and the most disturbing and taken for granted is what is the future of research? Like, how should we be doing our research in the future? Who should be involved? What is it? And of course, the future of research is also the future. Research is about the future. Research is inquiring and struggling to discover stuff that we don't know. It's really about what we need to know later, what we are going to find out. So for me, the question about this whole structure of graduate education is about raising people who could, who can, go out and learn new things as the world changes. It's not about teaching them a bunch of information or method or content. It's going to be teaching them for the future. And then, what about the future of our undergraduates? If we are a research university, at some level, I think everybody coming out of our university should do research. Everybody. Because that's, of course, what it means to be a research university. But what that means is that the whole goal of the university is to look towards the future. It's all about 
the knowledge that we don't have yet. It's all about that kind of inquiry. Now some of that in the humanities involves writing a research paper. Those of you who've taught in the humanities know regularly, we actually require people to do research papers. We specialize in teaching them research. That's one of the things that the graduate students do. They teach, I dropped this out by mistake, I apologize. We teach them to, to do research, which is to look through old stuff again and find new things, new meanings, new values, new possibilities emerging from things that are very familiar. So the future of our undergraduates is a future which needs a lot of research capacity. That's why we're here in some profound way. That's why we have research universities. And finally, I hesitate to ask this question yet one more time, because it's the question that everybody gets to ask, right? It's, what is the future of the university? So what does the university need to have a future? If I say that the university is involved in this research project of equipping everybody in it, everybody coming through it, because very few people actually will be in it, but people come through it, undergraduates in the tens of thousands, graduate students in the thousands. All of these people are coming out capable of learning things that nobody even knows yet, discovering new things, thinking in unusual ways, doubting the familiar. They've all been educated. So what about the university itself? What will keep the university capable of producing and reproducing that kind of change. And that's where I'll stop.